Greetings, everybody. I'm Chris Hislop. I am the executive director of the Montana World Fairs Council. And for the very few of you who may not know of us, uh, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit, and we are dedicated to engaging Montana's communities and schools in international issues to help Montana and Montanans understand what's going on, how does it affect us, and why does it matter? And doesn't that sound a little bit like what a library does, by the way? And, and so I'm extremely pleased and, and very uh, grateful to the library and to our friends here uh, who have uh, invited us and who are hosting us today um, as we go around Montana with Council General Schramm, whom I will uh, introduce in just a moment. But it was, I only wanted to introduce you to our organization because a couple of years ago, um, and you will all remember that time before COVID, uh, my colleague Nikki Geisler, who's sitting back there, our programs director, uh, ha had a very ambitious plan to expand our footprint across Montana to do more programs in more communities. So we came out here to Bozeman and we met a lot of you, uh, a lot of people here who said, oh, this sounds great. We would love to have your programs. And so we got all cycled up to do that. And then we know what happened in March 2020. So there has been a, a short delay, but I'm very happy. Uh, to tell you that if you've not seen it over the past three months, we've had four or five programs here uh, at the Museum of the Rockies and in different places with people like Ambassador Max Baucus, General Wesley Clark, former Governor Mark Rasco. We had um, Oliver Schramm's uh, French colleague, um, the French Council General came out to do programs. So this is what we do uh, in with distinguished speaker programs like this. I also want to let you know, we the bulk of our work is actually in schools across Montana, where we try to engage kids in what's going on, why does it matter, and what can they do about it. Bozeman High and Gallatin High School here are, are big uh, supporters of what we do. So if you have kids, grandkids, friends, neighbors, or whatever who are in the schools here, know that they're really heavily engaged in our programs already. Uh, and we've been doing this for some 23 years across Montana. So it's a real pleasure for us to kind of emerge out of COVID like you all, like this library, to come back, to be in person, to feel good, uh, and, and, and to invite uh, special guests like Council General Schramm, who I will introduce now. So Oliver Schramm took up his post as the Council General of Germany to get this now to Northern California, Oregon, Washington State, Alaska, Hawaii, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, and if that's not big enough, American Samoa. <laughs> From 2017 to 21, he served as Minister for Economic and Global Affairs at the German Embassy in London. And from 2014 to 2017, he served at the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Berlin as the head of division for German schools abroad and international sports cooperation. His various roles within the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs has stationed him in Seoul, Boston, Washington, DC, Rome, Lima, and London. Oliver began his uh, professional career in 1991, working in the political department of the, foreign, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Bonn, and then the Federal Chancellery as a member of the Chancellor's speech writing group from 95 to 98. He studied at Harvard from 2001 to 2002 and received an MPA from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. And Oliver is married and has three teenage sons. The best so, of luck. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Council General Oliver Schrapp. Thank you so much, Chris, for the kind introduction again. And thank you, Chris and Nikki, for a wonderful program. Um, not much uh, uh, breathing space, but that's <laughs> that's the, the purpose of the trip, and, and I'm really thankful for laying out all the wonders of Montana and uh, and uh, well, first and foremost of Bozeman. And I acknowledge and I I thank the mayor Susan Andrews for being here with us today. Um, and uh, I've arrived yesterday, as, as you said, um, starting my itinerary in Helena, meeting with the lieutenant governor and the office and, uh, and the mayor also and we've continued to a wonderful night in Bozeman and uh, I'm, I'm learning a lot about all that not of the state but this growing flourishing community Bozeman has to offer really in terms of uh, tech and 
and academic institutions that are growing. People, young people, talents that come to the States and uh, relocate and uh, start a family, start a life here. And certainly some, some people have already tried to introduce me to the Montana lifestyle. So I'm very much looking forward to that. So somebody already promised uh, under the motto, work hard, but play hard, also to introduce me to fly fishing. I talked about a, a raft and then a beer raft following our raft. <laughs> <laughs> I think it makes for a very interesting time. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll continue our trip for the next two days. And I really, as I said, I've come here to learn because sitting as a, uh, working as a uh, consul general in San Francisco uh, and, uh, and looking at the big district that Chris has just described, I, I'll never go to American Samoa, that's, that's for sure, that's, that's too far away. But I've been to Alaska, I've been to Oregon and, and now to Montana. But certainly the center of gravity is always where your office is. And hence, I'm extra glad I could free myself and, 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 and uh, forge ahead and, and finally come to Montana. I already tried to come in March. I was, I was unhappy at the time because my, my airplane didn't start. But I'm happy I'm now returning in June. I think that's a much better bargain now looking at these wonderful landscapes without snow and balmy temperatures in general. Um, yeah. Um, Janae has asked me to um, to maybe make some remarks regarding German politics, geopolitics, and certainly uh, the topic that's on everybody's mind these days is the war in Ukraine. Um, we've certainly seen the news these days with the G7 summit taking place in Bavaria, uh, the recent swings in German foreign and security policy. Um, the problems that are connected now with the war that, or that become more obvious when it comes to energy supply. So Germany has to change and restructure. We are coming out of a pandemic. That means we also have to see to get our supply chains in order and uh, to kind of overcome the latest developments and also try to restart, reignite our economies. That's been done on a national level. We have a new government since December and as new governments have it, they start with a very ambitious program and a coalition treaty and uh, in the first year or two, it's a four year legislature um, are filled and brimming with promise and, and hope and fresh money also laid out on the line. But certainly this war in Ukraine has, uh, has made things easier for us, but nevertheless, the government is forging ahead with their plans. We've now uh, enshrined a big, uh, a big piece of money into our constitution with the two thirds majority, 100 billion euros for a defense budget that is to sit there and uh, raise our defense capabilities and integrate that in a new European defense and security system. Uh, we've cut off some of the energy supply chains, especially those from Russia. We are building now LNG terminals in, in Germany. We are trying expeditedly to finish this energy transformation that Chancellor Angela Merkel announced after the catastrophe in Fukushima, sort of get out of nuclear, uh, and then according to the uh, Paris Agreement, also to reduce and then to end our dependency of coal powered electricity. Uh, and all of this comes at, at, at the same time, uh, and, and it's a big challenge. And uh, our, I think our um, public funds are quite cash-strapped at the moment, uh, and, uh, and uh, they have been completely filled uh, during the, the pandemic. But I think I, I, I feel there's a great sense of uh, unity and especially public support in Germany when it comes to these uh, measures when it comes to these political steps that have to be taken. If I look at defense and security alone, uh, I think just before the war, a poll would have given like a 20% support for a more robust stance of the Bundeswehr, the German armed forces in foreign security policy. That changed completely. It was a big swing to 
supporting now a bigger and more robust and more self-reliant and more integrated European defense stance. So we have now German troops. Uh, one, we have a battle command in Lithuania on the Eastern Front bordering with Russia. Uh, there are, there are um, other contingents uh, standing in Romania, uh, supporting Moldova uh, and, and, and other neighbors in, on the Eastern Front uh, of Europe. So that is, uh, that is something that is a big, big shift. Our Chancellor Olaf Scholz has uh, um, dubbed it uh, like three days after the invasion of Ukraine. He, caught, he spoke about a cycle and the turn of the tides and really for Germany, it is quite something before we had the rule that we would never export weapons or heavy weapons into areas of conflict. Now that has changed. And uh, I think if one thing, uh, where Vladimir Putin was mistaken, it was certainly um, to underestimate the resolve and the, the unity that the European Union member states and our European partners around Norway and the United Kingdom to mention have shown the resolve and, and uh, a much stronger cohesion than before. And of course, we have had our debates within the European Union now when it came to the sixth sanction packet. Hungary was much, uh, that is much more relying on uh, Russian oil imports has stalled a bit, but we found like always in Europe, in long night sessions, we always find a compromise. European Union is like a big tanker. If you want to change the course, you, you have to be very patient and it, it, it's really incremental, but it's moving ahead. And that is, I think that can be said for the whole project of European integration, which has given us um, which has given us the longest period of peace, at least within the European Union. Of course, you can say the war in Yugoslavia uh, was uh, was very close by. The war in Ukraine now is, is uh, in our neighborhood. But as such, in the European Union, um, that, that is a, a uh, that was an unpredictable success, but it is a success uh, beyond any expectations. I think even beyond what the founding fathers of the European integration process Robert Schumann, Konrad Adenauer, Jean Monnet have, have envisaged. And that basically meant that, um, that if, when before every family in Europe had lost relatives, uh, like every 15 to 20 to 30 years, there was a war running through Europe, many bloody conflicts that had ended and has ended for the foreseeable future. And uh, that, is, that is a great feat um, that cannot be underestimated. And I think that is also becoming clearer now with this conflict uh, right next to us. Um, and um, that is also expressed in, in, I think, in many polls in the public opinion again in Germany. So we have a great wave of refugees coming in again. So Ukrainians arrive by 10,000s every day at Berlin main station. So far, Germany has taken in the second largest group of, uh, of Ukrainian refugees, almost 2 million by now. Uh, and almost 200,000 students, Ukrainian students, are being taught in German schools. And uh, there's a great um, willingness and openness from German cities, starting in Berlin, but also smaller communities, to, to take in Ukrainian refugees. Um, with that said, uh, it's not clear whether they will stay on. Most of them, if you ask them now, they would, of course, immediately return to Ukraine once they could settle down peacefully. Uh, but um, as we've learned uh, in the past decades, that some that opinion can sometimes change. So I'm an example of that. So my mother came in the late 50s from Italy to Germany, where she met my father. and. Uh, Probably she had plans to lure him down to Italy, but that never worked out somehow. <laughs> and certainly in the later part of her life, she uh, loved Italy to go back to visit, but she said, well, it's, it's, uh, Germany is my place now. And that happened, of course, to many Turkish immigrants. That will happen to many Syrian refugees. Once they find a job perspective or they finish school or anything, that's, that's a great um, asset or economy, and although despite some of the voices or sounds you might hear, um, you might have heard right after 
this big wave of migration to Germany that said, well, it's that's um, that's a bad thing for the German society. It will change our lifestyle. They are coming from a different cultural background, being Muslims, and, and of course, then highlighting some criminal acts that were committed. Uh, um, and, and that saw, of course, the rise of one right wing party that even made it to the Bundestag, the federal parliament. This is now being reversed, luckily. But my opinion is different. One. Germany is uh, still a manufacturing country, it's an industrial country. We live of what our engineers um, produce in their brains and then transform into products and services, automotive and machinery and chemical industry. And uh, we're an aging society too. So our average age is 46 and rising and life exp expectation is rising too. And, and the social contract between the young and the old generation doesn't hold anymore. So there's a lot uh, of, there are a lot of challenges on the way to adapt to that. And, and, and we're thankful that medical progress uh, allows that, uh, the, these conditions. But uh, I think what Germany really needs is more migration in, in the end. So we need to reach out. I think by 2030, we'll be short of a couple million workers in our industries. And you might say, well, with digitization, the jobs change. Yes, they change to different professions, like they always changed. First wave of globalization around the 18 to 1900. Um, many jobs have gone, but uh, new ones came about. But still, we will be short of talent and, and, and uh, young, young workforce uh, in Germany. So that is, I think, the only way forward. What we need to get in order is, of course, a regulated or more regulated uh, European approach to migration. So we most likely have heard about the many bold people that try to cross the Mediterranean, trying to get to Europe, uh, other EU's try to use other paths uh, via the AGNC, et cetera. So this is still uh, not really resolved satisfactory. So we have to, as European, as Europeans, we have to um, really come together and, uh, and uh, sort out things. And uh, Germany is now trying to establish a point-based uh, immigration system to, to attract more young talents from all over the world. Speaking of the war in Ukraine, maybe my, that's my last remark. Um, this is also this is not only about uh, um, security and about um, um, supply chains, about food crisis because much of the wheat that was feeding Africa and other countries around is now blocked in the ports of uh, of Ukraine. But this is also about values, and democracy, and freedom, and freedom of speech, things that are a bit uh, underwater in Russia today. I would say if you look. At development since the war started, the many people arrested. So this is, um, this is also a fight um, and a conflict that goes to the heart of our, the essence of the societies and how we would, how we would like to live together. And uh, just walking one floor up through, um, through the exhibition, and thank you, Corey, for showing and explaining, uh, it kind of, uh, in many ways, brings back I think some of the aspects that we've lived in Europe in the late 20s, the early 30s, when masses got radicalized uh, in Germany, Italy, and Spain, uh, in these societies. And uh, of course, um, democracies were acknowledging and were seeing these facts. And that, that's a clear finding also of this exhibition. And that the facts were all out there, but then the consequence and the point where you say, well, now we have to do something about it, uh, are written on a different page. We all live this moment now, uh, be it in the US or in Germany and other parts of the world. What can we do? How can we help? And uh, what can we also do in our daily lives? And if we look at incidents that take place in Germany uh, with um, Jewish life that thankfully came back in the 90s after the occupation with a big wave of migration of Russian Jewish families uh, return, or going, coming to Germany, not going back, but coming to Germany. Uh, I see this 
again under threat, under duress. And uh, I'm uh, in, in Chris's presentation when he mentioned one, he could feel how old I am. He just served it all. Um, but this is this is something that I never imagined previously to be seeing in our lifetime in our society. Uh, I was I was under the irrational assumption that we were quite immune to certain aspects of it. Didn't we have uh, 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 Holocaust lectures and classes visiting concentration camp sites, you know, camps in Germany and many films coming out about that era, that time and, uh, and uh, wonderful programs run by the Central Council of Jews in Germany, visiting schools, now we have all these more and more these cobblestones in Germany that are kind of remembering Jewish presence in certain houses because we, the, the, the creator of this institution wanted to remind that those were actual people, actual families living in these houses. Those were neighbors of German families and they had a name and they had a profession and they had a place where they came from. So they, they are now being put out. So there, there are a number of wonderful things, Holocaust survivors, going to school, some do their programs on TikTok. So there's a lot out there, but still we have incidents like in Halle where a deranged person shot at the, at the door of the synagogue, trying to force his entry and, and other incidents going on uh, in other countries. So um, unfortunately, my, my final assumption is that, again, we have to stand up, we have to be vigilant, we have to uh, relate to uh, to conflict, and we have to stand up to to um, to to to, um, yep, to to all, all all the atrocities we see and the injustices that are unfolding, and uh, and I have to train that again. I think we were all too certain that certain incidents were a thing of the past and could be easily relegated to history books. And, I don't think it's, it's that way, but I'm not hopeless. I'm 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 an optimist, as diplomat by definition. Always we 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 we, um, we go ahead with the next meeting. If the, the last one didn't produce any results, we are looking back on the last one and uh, saluting the new one, the new meeting coming up. And um, uh, we always try to uh, enter into dialogue. Our chancellor even speaks to Vladimir Putin. Uh, on a regular basis, trying to sum him out, uh, which earned him some criticism. But I think that's that's his job as a politician. You have to sometimes you have to speak speak to people that you don't uh, share many views with, or you, you dislike. Um, but uh, but that is uh, that is something that uh, is like the new calling of the day. But um, I've seen a lot of great transatlantic initiatives spring up the last year. The Trade Technology Council coming up. The environmental partnership with between Germany and the U.S. the EU-U.S. dialogue, um, U.S. entering, re-entering the Paris Agreement. So there's, there's a lot going on in the transatlantic that was a bit subdued in the past years, but it's coming back. And I think with some of our systemic rivals, speak China, India, now a little bit on the on the sidelines. I think that puts more into focus what we can do for each other, Europe and, and the US and our partners in G7, what, what we are seeing now at the moment as the summit is coming to a close. Um, so I'm, I'm very hopeful, I'm very optimistic. And if one of the results is that we become aware one more time what we have achieved, but also what we, what we might lose and what we can do together, then I think uh, uh, we have good reason to to look ahead and, uh, and uh, if we can do a little bit of that between Montana and Germany and Bozeman and maybe a future sister city, I'd be even, even happier. So thank you.